Ah, and we are live. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started here in just a moment. We want to make sure everyone who's interested in watching is able to hop on with us. There will be a replay available if we can use the technology correctly to make that happen. So the live stream will begin here shortly. Hello. Welcome to Outgrowth, a slice of pro beauty. My name is Ashley Gregory. I'm one of the co-hosts of Outgrowth podcast along with Jamie Schraubeck. And given today's events, we are trying a slightly different format. We're here live. We sure are. Um, if you haven't yet heard, I'm not sure what you were doing all day. You were probably working, being productive. But California has closed salons in many counties effective immediately. And so we'll be discussing what happens next. Um, with us is our special guest, Wendy Jacobs Cochran of the California Aesthetic Alliance. So welcome, Wendy. How are you? Hey, I'm great. Thanks for having me on. This is almost as fun as being in Vegas together. No <laughs> kidding. <laughs> almost as fun. By that you mean not at all fun. <laughs> and I'm not wearing heels, so it's okay, man. <laughs> socially distanced. We're, we're trying our best. Obviously, if you're a listener of Outgrowth, you're used to hearing our voices. Now you see our faces and potentially our dirty office. Don't look at that. Um, but tonight we have lots of questions. And since I am a California licensed manicurist, but I live in Chicago and I'm also licensed in Illinois, I'm going to essentially be acting as the moderator tonight because uh, Jamie and Wendy have so much more knowledge about this than I do. So I'm here to be a um, conscientious observer. How about that? All right, so for both of you, was there any indication that this news was coming down today? Jamie, do you wanna go first? <laughs> you mean other than all the bad news that we've seen in the weeks leading up to this? Did I get forewarned? No, I wasn't given any forewarning other than we could all see the indicators and there certainly was a lot of criticism leveled against Governor Newsom throughout the weekend about what's happened since we reopened. Exactly. Um, um, from really? my conversations that I've had, um, you know, we've got a we've got a couple of um, counties that are still not open and so I had had several conversations and some Kind of goofy things like we didn't know if we could do facials in one county uh you know there was some bad information that was going back and forth but from my conversations that i was having with these counties and these people they kind of they were like you know we really hope that the counties will be serious about enforcement so that the governor doesn't have to come down and make these types of orders and they were all kind of like, you know, fingers crossed, you guys are going to do well and you're going to do the enforcement. We're not going to have a statewide shutdown. And apparently some of the counties weren't really taking that as seriously. And here we are. <laughs> so, yeah. So there wasn't any any indication that I had from any of the county discussions um, at all. Um, but. We were all sitting back, you know, in, in the California Esthetician, Esthetician Advocacy Group, we, we have over 6,000 members. And, you know, everybody over the last couple of weeks or so was like, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen with July 4th? And um, and then we started um, I started noticing and getting messages from our members uh, that was backstage saying, can you please share my story? Me and my entire family are sick with covid and it's the worst thing and it's awful. Um, and these were not even in markets that are your big um, typical skincare and and um, and manicuring and salon markets. These were some of the rural counties that we were not hearing from, too. So. Yeah, in a state population of 40 million people, it's going to be a challenge to get a, you know, a hold on this. Well, let's get into what exactly happened today and let's break down. I know, Jamie, you love to get into the language of things. And unfortunately, it looks like given the direction, we still have some language that needs to be clarified, just given the discussion I'm seeing. Um, 
these um, on the screen here, we have what was essentially put onto the website the second it was announced in Governor Newsom's um, press conference today. And these are the statewide and county closures. So some of the usual suspects here that we would expect as far as outdoor, or excuse me, indoor businesses like restaurants, bars, and breweries. Is there anything surprising here to you? And that's for anyone. I think, <laughs> I think what was confusing was that some of what he said today applied to the entire state. And then the portion about the salon closures that concern us applied to certain counties that were already on a watch list because of the increase in cases and hospitalizations. So the number of counties on that list, um, I guess we could argue maybe 30, 31 at the time that it was announced. Wendy, you might know better than I, but that number of counties actually represents 80% approximately of the entire population of California. So it's some of our largest population centers. And as Wendy said, some of those counties hadn't even opened yet. So last week we had 23 counties on this targeted engagement list. And this week currently we have 30. Um, as the governor was speaking this morning or this afternoon or whatever noon is, um, he uh, was mentioning that there were a couple of um, counties that were pending that were probably not included on that PowerPoint slide that had been made. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there were some changes that happened after that announcement. There are a couple more to be considered. And those, um, those uh, will be shown. I don't know if the map that we have is 100% accurate because it seems to have changed throughout the day. Uh, I'll put up what we have here um, if you want to take a look at it. I know that you had mentioned there was going to be potentially some counties added and subtracted even today. Uh, yeah, so Placer might be included in that, um, which is one of the counties between Tahoe and Sacramento. Um, there was another, um, San Luis Obispo is apparently kind of on the fence with their numbers as well. But I can also um, read to you guys really quickly what um, counties are considered um, on the list right now, because I have that um, pulled up on my screen, if you don't mind. Sure. Okay, Alameda, Colusa, Contra Costa, Fresno, Glen, Imperial, Kings, Los Angeles, Madera, Marin, Merced, Monterey, Napa, Orange, Placer, Riverside, Sacramento, San Benito, San Bernardino, uh, San Diego, San Joaquin, San Luis Obispo, uh, Santa Barbara, Santa Clara, Solano, Sonoma, Stanislaus, Sutter, Tulare, Ventura, Yolo, and Yuba. So yeah, I, I can confirm that several of those uh, were not on the graphic that he presented at noon today. So there's more than 30 counties. Wow. Well, given the fact that there's 30 counties that have either um, in, instituted these immediate shutdowns because, or closures, I guess, whatever word we're looking for, Jamie, do you have any info on when that took effect? I know there was some confusion I was seeing throughout social about people waiting for word, and I'm wondering what word they're waiting for. Yeah, I think it, again, is a misunderstanding as to whose authority we're following. And if the governor says effective immediately, I would assume that would be as soon as he utters that from his mouth, or if it had been issued as a press release prior, which that had not been the case I don't think. I think it was first announced during the press conference. That should have been immediately. So I wasn't at work today. So that meant that as far as my schedule goes for the rest of the week, I was ready to cancel things. So um, so in California, because I know there's some viewers that are not in California. So we'll explain really quickly that we have 58 counties in our state, a population of 40 million individuals. So of the 58 counties, we also have three additional big cities, uh, Los Angeles, uh, Pasadena, or I'm sorry, Long Beach, Pasadena, and uh, uh, Berkeley that have their own health departments that you go by. 
uh, the governor's order was immediate, but some of the counties uh, decided to say, you know, at another time, like tonight at midnight or tomorrow uh, and things like that. And I think that caused quite a lot of confusion, but it is my understanding that that, that, that order was specific to immediately today. Um, there was some confusion. Um, some people said there was some sort of tweet that went out about, you know, three days. It's going to close down for three days. They were misunderstanding what this targeted engagement um, thing actually is. So if a county, because the numbers of the testing take a little bit of time to come in and correlate and analyze that data and decide if the state's going to put them on the list, that usually is roughly a span of about 72 hours from an OES perspective. OES is Office of Emergency Services. Um, and so OES and the CDPH, the California Department of Public Health, need about 72 hours to kind of give the counties a call and say, hey guys, your numbers are climbing and climbing and climbing. In the next two, three days, we may be putting you on this list. So that's that's where some of that you know three day confusion was. It doesn't mean that in three days we're going to open back up again. It just means that that was that's kind of the standard warning any of the counties get um, before they are rolled back with that dimmer switch that Newsom talks about. The dimmer switch is um, I love analogies, but um, I think that one might be a little bit flawed. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> no heart, one more time. <laughs> I just want to mention we're getting some questions. Um, I we will definitely try to get to as many of those as possible. If we have answers for you, I know there's a lot of questions and not a ton of answers. Um, because we're using a streaming platform called StreamYard, it just needs your permission to be able to show your name and picture. If you go to streamyard.com slash Facebook, it'll allow me to show your beautiful face next to your question. Um, let's get into the actual close list that is coming from the COVID website. <clears throat> and this is essentially for the counties that are on that list that you read, Wendy. So we're looking at closing indoor operations. And now here's where I think a lot of the clarification is needed because of the second half of that first sentence, but they may be modified to operate outside or by pickup. Now, Jamie, we've discussed in previous episodes of Outgrowth Podcast, through the Mork CDS index <laughs> that you invented, that um, some of this language in the guidelines, no matter what state you're in, it, it can really be a bit difficult to understand and require further clarification. I think that wording gave those of us in the beauty industry maybe some glimmer of hope. I didn't have any myself because I don't see where that would be possible, but. I want to punt to Wendy because she's the one that was able to get that clarified with the BBC to make sure that we understand that we are not to be operating outside of our licensed establishments. Yeah. So the referee, throw up that language. <laughs> the referee. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk. Here's the exact language in the um, article two here that you sent me earlier. This is the business and professions code. This is the part that governs our industry here in California. So the BBC laws still apply to us even during a pandemic. So here we have, I mean, it's kind of obvious. Why bother having an establishment license issued to an address if you can just work in the parking lot? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. So it is it meant to be issued to a building. Okay. Yeah, so um, from the perspective of um, this, this chapter and code right here, 7317, um, the sidewalk, a patio, an outdoor space like a parking lot uh, is not considered part of the establishment. And um, there's been some confusion um, in San Diego County, in Riverside County, in some of the other counties that I've been watching and people have been dumping all these text messages at me all afternoon. Um, these, uh, these counties are saying, you know, or they had some official come on live and say, if you could do it outside, so go ahead and cut hair outside, which is not correct. They spoke without understanding how our regulations are so our regulations actually are the roof above us, right? Not the whole entire, you know, 
next hundred or so feet outside of the building. Um, so all those services have to be under that roof of that establishment per 7317 and have to take place. You can't just, you know, as convenience, go out to the deck and start cutting hair and doing nails and giving, you know, lashes or a facial at this time. So, okay. And I did happen to see that um, BBC posted to their Facebook page, essentially saying in much plainer language, this does not mean you can do services outside. Um, now, there has been some discussion around a personal service permit. And I know that discussion is ongoing. Um, <laughs> we're making faces. But as far as these on-demand beauty apps and things that honestly shouldn't be operating right now, or I've, I've seen some beauty professionals talking about going to ground and, and just basically pretending they haven't heard this. Um, what advice would you have for beauty professionals who are kind of staring down the barrel of this additional closure and the, the choices that they're prepared to make just based on circumstances? Jamie, Wendy? The, the same advice I give always, which is to comply. And I know that's the hardest thing to hear, but we're in this situation because we haven't complied. And the we is not just we in the beauty industry, it's we as Californians not taking this seriously enough. So whether it's the mask wearing, the social distancing, the avoiding the family gatherings, I don't think people have taken the message to heart that this is so serious that we are going to lose businesses. That's not the worst of it. We're going to lose friends and family. We're going to lose loved ones in our community. That's the hardest part. Wendy, what um, <laughs> your stage words here? You know, we have a license. You can you can go ahead and start doing lashes without a license, and that won't be um, you know illegal. You are risking the fact that you are going to have some sort of you know citation or uh, police involvement in giving you a citation on a local level. I don't know what to say about mobile services and things like that, other than we've been trying to hash out the PSP since, I don't know, what is that, four years now, Jamie? At uh, least. Yeah, and they are still trying to change the regular, or adopt the policy and the regulations for that bill. And it's it's just never ending. <laughs> Never they're not, yeah, they're not legal. And I want to give some credit to Associated Professionals for putting out an email pretty quickly, letting their insurance customers know that as licensees, we're obligated to work under whatever orders and existing regulations that there are, and that we're not going to be covered if we are going underground or you know sneaking people into our salons and working when we're not supposed to be i think that's the most important part i, I see a lot of conversation around well i pay in for my license every year therefore um i should have a prorated amount next year for the weeks i haven't been able to use my license that we've been shut down um and the fact that people are saying well you know I've been threatened with potential loss of license or it's a misdemeanor if I continue to operate. But the other side of the coin that I don't think a lot of people think about is your liability insurance will absolutely not cover you if you are performing services during any kind of shelter in place, whether it's in your county, your city, wherever that is. And that's the thing that for some reason seems to be overlooked. And I don't know if that's a commentary on how many of us are actually carrying professional liability insurance and how many of us are just letting it slide. Um, but I did want to just point to the comment below from Myra from the PBA. She's given the link directly to where the counties are. So thank you for watching, first of all, Myra. Thank you for being a guest on Outgrowth in the last few weeks. And um, this is where you can go to see if your county is affected, if it's kind of on the line or not. Um, Ashley, to your point about the liability insurance it's not a requirement of us in the state mm -hmm. of california to carry liability insurance it's a best practice and i don't know the numbers i i think that might be something really interesting coming out of this you know how many more people have signed up for liability insurance realizing that you know you could lose everything from having someone sue you 
whether or not they can prove their case or not, you're still going to be inconvenienced for sure. But for those of us who do value compliance and whose clients value compliance, this is d difficult, but it was not unexpected. And I know we're calling this, I don't know what kind of list, we're, I call it the naughty list. I mean, when we talk about this list of counties, and it isn't a surprise if your county is appearing on this list because there had to have been a number of days where you led up to this being placed on this list and you're not gonna get it off it quickly. That's the thing. Um, the last round of closures that went through, we were told it was going to be a three week closure for, um, now I can't even think about what it was, Wendy, because it wasn't related to our industry. What was the last thing that got closed? Uh, bars and restaurants, indoor dining, is that what you're yeah, thinking? Yes, yes, so that was just what, last week? Yeah. So it was at a minimum, it was gonna be three weeks. And I think saying something like that sort of takes some of those questions away, like, oh, well, should I just cancel people day by day or week by week? It's like, no, I would, I would plan for three weeks or longer because of the lag in testing and then the hospitalization rates. And then of course the positivity rates on the testing really need to come down in order for the health officials and the governor to feel confident to revise these orders again. And to speak to the part about the salon suites, um, I've been getting messages over the last couple of hours that some of the salon suites are, um, are actually gonna start charging rent again and have advised people that um, that if they choose to work, that's on them. Uh, at, the, at the March shutdown, they had everybody pull everything out of their salons so that there wasn't any sort of um, vandalism or theft going on when nobody was in those meeting, in those uh, meeting rooms and, and, uh, and in those salon suites. And so um, I have been getting messages, unfortunately, from people that rent from the big salon suite companies that are going to start charging people and just saying, oh, well, you got it. We'll defer it to the end of your contract. Well, we definitely have an episode about that. Um, it's called Communicating with Clients and Landlords. And we also, I think we uh, covered that, Jamie, in our episode with um, Amy Tepper from Legal in a Box as far as what options you do have with regard to renegotiating your commercial lease and trying to figure out, I mean, we're, we're all in the same boat, but as far as what direction it's going in, uh, that's, that, that's debatable. Um, just putting up some of the comments here from people watching as far as just correcting some of that bad info that's out there about that language from the website. Um, let's see here. They're taking the language that applied it to restaurants. Right. And they're not realizing that, you know, other businesses are gonna like look at that and they're gonna think, wow, if I could only just make that work because that's what we try to do. We try to make things work. And if we can find a gray area, we will. But I think the BBC has made it quite clear that there is no gray area here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also we are, you know, we are, our, our rules are in law. So, you know, people have asked if, if all of a sudden, why can't the BBC be flexible and change their, their rules and all that stuff? This is actually California law that we have to work under those establishments. So they can't just like temporarily, the BBC can't temporarily just say, oh, it's okay, you guys do parking lot haircuts, it's all good. They can't do that. We actually have to have an executive order from the governor that says that we can do that in order to temporarily change the law. So um, yeah, that's that's a tough part. Um, and also I have to say, um, the BBC has gotten beat up on, on a level that is just unbelievable. Um, and they are not driving this bus. Uh, the CDPH, uh, the governor and those teams are the ones that are driving the bus. So for everybody that's tearing you know, the BBC apart and saying that they don't care, uh, that saying any of us that are advocating for the industry don't care. Um, that's, it's very much not true. And and from my communications, literally when when Newsom was speaking today, Christy Underwood emailed me and said, you know, ugh. And we both sent the same emails to each other at the same time that said ugh. And, um, you know, we both know that um, 
everybody's going to get beat up over these unfortunate closures, but it is what it is. You know, last week when we had, you know, Newsom reporting that seven persons died that day, Monday we have 23 persons dying this day. So that's significant. You don't have to be a math genius to know that the numbers are significantly rising. And these are not just, you know, the 70 year olds, the 80 year olds that are living in assisted living. That that age range um, for death and um, and illness, which will be long term in their case, is actually lowering because of the um, because of the bar population, because everybody that's, you know, 20, 25 years old needs to be social. Right. And so those numbers are slowly coming down as far as age av average and all that stuff too. So yeah, it's pretty tragic. Well, and I'm watching this with very keen interest because I'm in Chicago and our mayor Lightfoot today said, we're looking at closing any dining and bars just based, you know, they, they, that old saying that um, as goes California, so goes the rest of the country. And just because you have such a huge population and um, you're so geographically spread out to have these numbers is very alarming. And uh, we're seeing things happening in states like Florida, Texas, Tennessee. And there's essentially, I think we're looking at a crystal ball here in California for the rest of the country. And for some reason, the, the politicized for ha to have masks be something and wearing masks and practicing social distancing be something that has now become politicized. We are literally reaping what we sow right now. And so for because of some bad actors and people who are choosing not to participate for whatever reason, we in the beauty industry are being penalized because we are hands on touching bodies, getting close, looking closely, being you know, in there and unable to socially distance. And here we are. Yeah, COVID-19 doesn't care who you vote for. And it also correct. doesn't understand that our entire industry is an industry that works in a, in a 12, 12 inch space. Um, you know, many of our salons and, and establishments are, you know, a small room, often not ventilated. It's, um, you can put as many boxes over people as you want and that sort of thing too. It's about circulating air in the room. And, and so that's why the shift is that outdoor activities are allowed. But unfortunately, the law of the state of California doesn't allow us to work outside because it's literally the establishment under which we work in. And so, didn't we just hear about a step up in enforcement? There was some talk about you know, a crackdown on businesses that weren't complying. This is the biggest crackdown of all is just to shut us down again. And we know there would have been pushback even against the stepped up enforcement. We know that there would have been people saying, hey, just let those people make a living. It's none of your business. Let them do what they have to do to survive and put food on the table. And so now what? Now we are in a situation again where the compliance is going to really make a difference and not just because we can show that we can do it, but because it should prove itself in the results. It's going to take a while for those results to show though. That's the really frightening thing is that with this lag in testing, if it's taking seven to 10 days to get a test back when you're not an athlete or a celebrity or a politician, then we're just going to see those case numbers go up and then the hospitalizations will follow as will the death rate. Yeah, the, the rates of testing return results are pretty all over the board in the state of California. You know, sometimes in L.A. or San Diego County, um, you get an immediate result within 24 hours. Sometimes in the rural counties, they have to drive over an hour to get, um, you know, a test. And then their results aren't coming in in seven to 10 days. It's, it's actually extended. So they have to self-quarantine and things like that, too. But to the point of the strike um, teams that uh, Newsom rolled out, he was really hopeful that those strike teams in collaboration with educating with the BBC, um, going out into the field along with the health department would help educate. And then if anyone was really blatant about, you know, not wearing masks or just thumbing their nose at what the, what the orders were, uh, they were hoping to mitigate this then. Uh, at that point last week, I believe um, the BBC had inspected 
at least 334 salons and spa spaces um, and kind of went in and said, hey, by the way, you need to do this. You need to make sure everybody's wearing masks and you can't have two people servicing people at the same time. And all those things, they tried to get ahead of it and people and their noncompliance really kind of put us back in this space um, just from an exposure level. You know, we see so many people every day in a, in a space that's like this. Wendy, do you know if those visits were prompted by complaints or were they just in a particular geographic area and going in? Um, I would guess with the number, you know, we still run with about 18 to, um, oh, I have a Wookiee in the room. I, I, was just, I, was like, I hear your dog. <laughs> uh, I have one of four dogs in the room. She's usually asleep, but she's mad that I'm not playing ball with her right now. Um, so normally uh, we have about between, I don't know, roughly in the entire state of California, about 20 inspectors and three people that are managers of all those inspectors of every establishment, which is about 53,000 of those individual establishments, um, about 20 inspectors. And for those 20 inspectors in one week to do 334 targeted wow. inspections, it's probably, it is to my knowledge, it is to my knowledge because they were reported as still working or working not, not compliant, so. Wow. Um, well, Jamie, what do you think comes next? Hmm. Not to put you on well, the spot or anything. No, but. that's okay. I, I think as before, we have decisions to make. We have a, a professional obligation to comply, and yet we know already that there are salon owners and beauty professionals who are going to defy these orders. And then maybe the question becomes, what do the rest of us do about it? What are our clients going to do about it? Are they going to wait for us or are they gonna go somewhere else? And how do I feel about that? If someone were to go somewhere else, I would feel fine as long as they were going to a county that was open. I would not be concerned about that. But if they were going to be part of the problem, I find that highly offensive just as I find it really offensive that there are salon owners and beauty pros who may be defying these orders at this very moment. It hurts all of us in terms of our professionalism. We complain about being over-regulated. Well, we're demonstrating why we need to be regulated because yeah. we can't manage it on our own and we don't take care of our own either or keep our own in line. And that goes across all the different license types. I don't care what ethnicity you are. I don't care what kind of establishment you have because wherever our types of services are being done, whether it's a med spa or a podiatry practice or just a one person operation, doesn't really matter. It has to be licensed and we have to follow the rules. Well, there's a definite cause and effect situation happening right here, but it, it seems because it takes a few weeks for the cause to have an effect that they're not being linked together in the minds of the people who need to be convinced that their actions or inactions are directly causing these things to happen. And so we can only do so much as beauty professionals by being compliant and mask wearing, social distancing, all of the different guidelines that are being given to us. Um, but when it comes to just people at the grocery store, people in public, people going to gyms and flagrantly flaunting these requirements and recommendations, we're starting to see that unfortunately in the beauty industry, we are, we're the ones having to pay the bill because we are in general, the first to close and the last to reopen. And so I, I understand the frustration that's out there because we had a taste of it. We got to be back for a little while and now to have this happen, it's very strange to me to see the reactions from people who are saying, I'm not doing it. I'm not, I'm just gonna put my head in the sand and pretend I didn't hear. And so, um, I don't know, do we, do we want the karmic <laughs> retribution of reporting these salons as fellow beauty professionals? What are, what are your takes on that? So I, um Listen, um, people in my group tend to be the rule followers. And to be honest, um, they know what to label. 
They know how to label. They know the rules. They know the reason for the rules. So there should be no reason that they would be afraid of having an inspection if it were to happen because they're already up on it. So, you know, do what we need to do right now and, and we can remain open. But unfortunately, we only have 6,000 out of 90,000 estheticians in the state of California, you know, and, um, you know, 340,000 some odd Cosmos that can also do skin too. So, yeah, I mean, me personally, um, I've shared this philosophy in my group too. I will provide people the link to go ahead and, um, and report a salon um, in order to gain everyone's trust. I don't report salons. Um, just because I have 6,000 people that need, that maybe don't know the rules because their school didn't go over it or they haven't taken the time or don't know how to find those rules on the state board website and really understand and comprehend what's going on. So in order to trust me, I personally don't turn them in unless I know that it has affected my client immediately or it is a, a school or something that's being very blatantly breaking the laws and showing people how to do things out of scope and things like that and harming the future of our industry. Um, but I encourage people to be very honest. There's no karma here. If you know how to label your stuff, if you're working in scope, you're good. Invite her in for a glass of water when we can offer a glass of water again, you know. Um, and you have to realize that these inspectors have got a lot on their plate, a lot on their plate. And they are met with so much opposition and, and physical violence at some point um, where they have been assaulted for just doing an inspection because, you know, that's scary, you know. That's very scary. Yeah. Wow. Uh, well, we have a couple questions and I've just been flashing up some of the comments we've been getting kind of real time here. A lot of the conversation is just around um, that we need to lead by example as far as professionalism goes um, and letting clients go that don't want to adhere to the restrictions and regulations. Um, lots of agreement. I think you know we have some, there are people who, who are not agreeing with us, which is also fine. Um, but this, uh, this one really kind of caught my eye from Amber Lynn about a salon in Costa Mesa that was publicly advertising a mask-free experience. That just, that chills me to the bone. Well, that's Orange County. Um, Orange County is also considering sending all the kids back to school without social distance or mask requirement. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we do have... <laughs> <laughs> that, may, that might be a, a discussion for another time, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, no, I understand. And thank you for the yeah. geography lesson. I'm. Yeah, I was born and raised in Wisconsin and uh, live in Chicago. So um, you can tell by my accent, I don't get to the West Coast all that often. Yeah, so, um, you know, Southern but, California, we do have a couple of, of counties that have been pretty in 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 their face about uh, not following the rules and that sort of thing. It doesn't mean that all the citizens and all the people that live in those counties uh, agree with it. Um, and certainly in the more compliant counties, um, it doesn't mean that they disagree or agree either. Uh, just to note, um, the first counties to open up were Yuba and Sutter, and they opened up on May 4th, and they were allowed a half an hour each. And these are little tiny, tiny mining communities up in the gold country of California. And they have now made the list, and they were only allowed a half an hour for their service times. You came in, you know, paint, 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 lashing, whatever was gonna go on was gonna be a half an hour and that was it. And now they are on the list and they are some of the smallest counties in the, in, in the, in the state and they're now on the list and they've been open the longest. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's concerning uh, people, you know, yeah, Ashley, when you come to California, I know you prefer to come to Northern California. Don't you dare. Um. <laughs> but no, I do want to say something about geography because certainly people can look at the state and realize, you know, that that's a lot of territory. And there is a difference between Northern California and Southern California. But I will say we're also, I can speak for Monterey County, we are experiencing this um, division within our county where we have the coastal community versus the Salinas Valley 
where the bulk of the cases are in the Salinas Valley, but because we're part of one county, we have to take responsibility for that. And I know that perhaps some people that live on the peninsula side are complaining, you know, it's not fair, it's not us, it's uh, the people in prison, it's this, it's that. We have to be responsible for everybody because we intersect, we interconnect. And if we're going to point our fingers, well, let's look at who those people are. Those people are picking our food. Those people are working throughout this. They're essential workers. We need to take better care of them. That's what needs to be happening. 100%. This is really putting into perspective, and I think maybe sharp perspective, just how ill-prepared we are and how reactive we are when it comes to things like this. And for some reason being told that you need to do something that's mildly inconvenient for the greater good has created all of this pushback. Um, I just want to throw up a few more questions and comments here. Um, and I'll say that, you know, in San Diego County where I am, we get a lot of pushback here because we have a lot of cross border culture. Um, and, uh, and we also have a lot of expats that live in Mexico. And so, um, Mexico has Northern Baja has, um, 10 ventilators for the entire state of Baja North. And a lot of the expats live down there because it's inexpensive to live and they have, um, contracted, um, the virus, unfortunately. And so they have been shipped into Imperial County that couldn't handle the bulk. So they came to San Diego County, there were too many of them, and now they're in Riverside and San Bernardino at some of our hospitals up here. So we're all doing what we can um, as far as that is going on as well. So, yeah. So I wanted to, sorry to block you, your, uh, <laughs> block you there, Wendy, but Michelle makes a good point, but I think we should absolutely address it. So salons being um, really held to account for cases from home gatherings, things, and uh, you mentioned about Yuba and Sutter, the fact that these aren't being traced back to salons, so we are in a completely different situation than we were when Governor Newsom said that um, infamous line about the first case of community spread coming from a nail salon. This is not that, um, from my understanding, it's because the general population is not doing what they need to in order to prevent the spread of this. So it's not, this is not an indictment of our industry. It's, un, it's an unfortunate consequence of the fact that our client pool is intermingling and doing all the things that they shouldn't be doing in some cases. And now because of this amount of spread and the fact that it's beyond the capacity for contract tracers to even try to figure out um, that we have to just, dim the switch a little bit. I saw one comment that mentioned tourists, and that's certainly an issue for areas that attract tourists, typically year round. Uh, as the temperatures go up in the Central Valley, everyone comes to the coast and the beaches were shut down, but that doesn't mean that, that the town isn't crowded with people. And we see tourists you know, flaunting the rules what are you going to do about that? They go home, they might have either left us with the disease or taken it back with them to their home counties or you know home states because who knows from how far they're traveling to get to us. So you know, that's another issue that we're dealing with. We're not just dealing with an isolated county where we're just controlling who's you know within our own borders. Uh, we're not that far from Silicon Valley. There's people who there are people who commute to work, but most people aren't going into offices these days, but you might travel some distance to go uh, do some sort of job for which you're considered essential. So it's not, yes, there's a lot of land here, but there is this interconnectedness and Santa Cruz County is not on that list, is it, Wendy? Uh, it is not. And I have heard of quite a few problems with the people in Santa Clara actually losing their clients to Santa Cruz County because they just go over the 17 there into Santa Cruz um, because Santa Clara has not officially kind of opened up all that much. They opened up for like a day today. Um, they were one of the Bay Area counties that was first to adapt that. And then um, and then we have, you know, all of a sudden they're open for one day 
and this happens. And they ended up on the list of, of counties uh, that are being monitored. So yeah, it's tough. It's well, tough. And we're not, it's not March anymore, right? It's not March, no. it's not the beginning of April. We should be much wiser now, um, but doesn't that feel like 15 years ago? Um, <laughs> when we were all in New York um, for the beauty experience, that was not to be. Um, but since it isn't March and since it isn't April, I had a really good point that I was gonna make and it has, it's gone. Um, but essentially because it isn't March or April, we had the 4th of July happen. And it's like, just as a country, we decided, I'm tired of this. I don't want to deal with it anymore. I want to drink on a boat. And so, <laughs> you know, here we are. And it's it's a, it's a little scary, but um, it's hard to put that toothpaste back in the tube. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we had Memorial Day, numbers went up. We had 4th of July, a month later, a month and a half later, the numbers went up. And then what do we have in September? We have another three day weekend. I mean, I think part of the, the, the you know, we all kind of get crazy about it in our beauty industry because we are not essential. You have to realize that like 60 to 70% of everybody is still working and they're still going to work or not on Monday through Friday. And they have an actual weekend where a lot of us are kind of like, oh, what day is it? <laughs> I'm not even working. I have no idea if it's Thursday or if it's Tuesday. No clue. So, you know, we have a situation where, um, you know, these people are needing a weekend to go and blow off steam of how hard it was juggling the fact that they got a meeting and they got three kids flying around behind them. And they need the time off to go to the beach and decompress and do some fun, after, you know, activities outdoors with their family. Or they need time away from their family to you know restore with us um and and i think that's a lot of what we're seeing too is these weekend activities are just it's really tough it's really tough you know we yes. got complacent is what happened exactly. we really did i mean at, at one point the state of california and our governor was being lauded for handling this and then as soon as things started loosening up i think everyone thought okay it's done and we're just gonna resume our activities and reconnect with people we haven't seen in a really long time. And so I think that messaging, we've talked over and over again about how it could have been done better. Uh, one of my fears as we you know, encounter the weeks ahead is that we'll just get the same guidance reissued again without it having been reviewed and no improvement on the message, you know, even though they have this additional time to do that, that's my concern. Yeah. I, I would think that they could learn from what they did wrong the first time around. Let's not do that yeah. again the same way. That I makes don't know. A lot of sense because, uh, but also we're not seeing salons really being the, the source of any kind of spread. And so I, I honestly, I don't even, this is definitely not realistic, but to see some of those, recommendations be enforced on the public. I can't agree with that though. I can't. Yeah. yeah. It's happening. It's happening. happening. We're just Good. not hearing about it as much. Yeah. yeah. So San Diego County has a big resort and also we have quite a few um casino resorts that are um uh on Indian and tribal land and those have all been kind of open and doing their thing. Um and we've had some issues in some of the tribal land especially outbreaks um near me. Um, and also there's a big resort uh, down in San Diego that is, is the center of community spread. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, we even had a member in the California Estheticians Group who went from one county all the way over to three counties, possibly contracted it while shopping with family and then came back to their rural county and brought it and then exposed clients. So I'm seeing it, um, Orange County isn't really reporting it that way. Um, and that, and that, and Riverside is not reporting it that way too. Uh, it's there, it's there. We are definitely seeing it, you know. Good. Yeah, not being in your state, um, it's difficult, you know, 
I, I'm very impressed with where I'm from and our, our mayor turned into a meme very early on with, um, she's a woman of pretty short stature and she, <laughs> She was at the, she's like giving mean mugging in the background of all of the press conferences. There's cardboard cutouts of her on porches and stuff saying like, no, <laughs> go home, stop well, it. Kind of get popped in the, in the beginning of all this for getting she her. She did hair. get a haircut. Like she that. did get a haircut. Newsom is yes. pretty shaggy and gray right now. And I like it. <laughs> well, we have a, you know, it, she, she can't win if she were to get a haircut or not get a haircut. So that's again, another conversation, but um, I've just put out the final call for questions or comments. Um, we're being told, hey, we wanna see more of this. So Jamie, remember, it's good that we were prepared. Um, we had a few, um, Lynn saying she only got one week open. Um, Amber Lynn saying that she feels the frustration more for those who were able to open and then had to close again. Um, and then Marlies with some, dropping some knowledge for us, there's definitely ways to travel and be responsible. Oh. <laughs> I, think, I think there are ways that, um, you know, it is kind of a big bummer for some people that opened up for a couple of weeks and were like, oh, I don't know how to deal with this mask and this shield and it's all crazy and I don't know if I'm doing this right or anything like that. I hate to say this is maybe a positive thing, that now that you've done it a little bit, you may be able to tweak how you're working. You may be able to improve those systems on your own. So that we are, when we are really slowly, you're going to be used to wearing the mask. Maybe wear the face covering at home and learn how to breathe with it a little bit better. Maybe find a better shield um, that works for you a little bit better. And maybe understand how to communicate with your clients um, and, and keep that really open communication and say, look, we are on this weird dimmer switch that we don't understand. So I may have to push you a little bit out in your appointment times and things like that. So I think there are positive things that we can go and, and look for some of those people that opened up and now got kind of yanked back. Um, so I hope that you, know, you can all kind of take a breath in the next couple of days to kind of focus on those, on those things in order to kind of make it easier on yourself when you do return because you were like, whoo, I'm out of breath and I am out of shape and I am out of timing. I saw a lot of that information. Everybody doesn't know their timing anymore because now yeah. we've got these weird things we're trying to do and, and it's just not natural for us. So now you kind of stumbled through it for a week or two. Let's take those, those experiences home and let's practice them on, on our unwilling pets and family members and, um, and <laughs> turned it into a positive. I need to see that dog. Can you can you pick her up and show me? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> That's a big dog, where's, isn't it? Where's the Angus when you need Angus? Oh, I know. He's oh, been hi. In. That's Matilda. She wants to she she's throwing a Kong around the room because she she wants to play ball and and she can't right now. So. Oh, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's up. Actually, I'd like to address the question that we saw about yes, whether yes, or not but, it's our professional responsibility or something we should take here. upon ourselves. Yeah. My answer to that is an absolute yes. Uh, my, surprise me. my answer is yes. Um, do I do it myself? No, because I'm. everybody already assumes I'm a narc and I'm not a narc. <laughs> so... Um, and, and I do have to, I do have to maintain this trust, um, and give you the right information because that's always been my thing is giving you the right information, the right links, the right contacts, the right language in order to do the right thing for your business. Um, and in, and in order for me to teach a, a group as large as our group is, um, I need to have a level of trust that if somebody says, uh, is derma planning, I've been doing derma planning. What do you think? I, I have to have that little tiny bit of level of trust that they're going to say that I'm not going to go immediately to Christy Underwood and say, hey, by the way, Janet Salon is doing derma planning and I read it in my group. That's not where I want to go with this. My group's intention is to educate people and give them the resources so they understand what is and what isn't legal and why it is or is not legal. And so I don't report um, if I didn't have this group, I'd be like dropping it like. Like it's hot. 
Yes. Well, and Wendy, let me let me say this: that I report things that I know to be true for myself that affect me, and the I happen to be a member of your group, and I do not report things that I see in your group for that very same reason because it's a different relationship that you have with the members of your group. You are there to educate first, and that's what. Ashley and I have been trying to do throughout this entire process is provide the information. So if you don't have the information, there's really no excuse for not knowing where to go to get it. And if you need clarification, there's a lot of information floating around out there, but there are sources you can trust. And we're trying to build that with our audience of listeners and in this case, viewers. So yes, I, you know, education has to come first, but as we've learned through this process, Education is not enough. I mean, what is it going to take for people to actually comply? Yeah. And I think a report, honestly, coming from someone who's in that locality and you are directly affected by a salon in your area not being compliant because they're creating a dangerous situation for your client pool and for your business. And so, yes, absolutely. I would report something that I know to be true or that I could verify through a third party or whatever that is. This isn't um, the way, you know, this isn't RuPaul's best friend race, but it also is about just being responsible. And so where we may have shied away from that in the past of not wanting to, or, or having that camaraderie and not wanting to be the person to take someone down, it's life or death now. And the, the rules of the game have completely changed. So if you're feeling like you don't wanna be that person, totally understandable, but just know that again, it's that cause and effect that we talked about earlier. And also, you know, I have to realize that, you know, um, you went to university, Jamie went to university, I went to university, learning how to research things and understand how those, you know, how those links work, like uh, any state website is really difficult to navigate. And so that's also the reason that, you know, and also my mother was a librarian, so I've never had a question answered for me ever in my lifetime. And so I am used to being a competitive speech and debater in the times where you had to go to microfiche in an actual library. There was no inter internet, no, no, none of that. You actually had to look at books and magazines and periodicals and find that stuff. So it, it is challenging for some of us that don't know how to do the, the research and understand this. So that's why I 100% I want to give people the right resources and kind of explain the process of what's going on. So and Wendy, you have proved throughout this experience, it's not what Wendy says, it's what Wendy is telling you that someone else has said. And uh, today was another example. I just got quoted in the comments. So I, I'm like, we got to end on that note because I can't top that. Um, no, you, you can't. Angela. <laughs> Thanks, Angela, for that. That's, um, that makes me real happy. Well, before we walk away, um, this obviously has been very successful. We've had between 60 and 70 people watching the entire time. Um, That's great. Isn't that awesome? Yes. And of course, if you like what you heard here and you like this uh, lively banter and discussion, you can subscribe to Outgrowth Podcast on your favorite podcast platform, as well as follow us on Instagram. Um, you, Wendy, tell us how we can connect with you. Uh, so we are California Esthetician, Esthetician Advocacy on Facebook. If you look up California Esthetician, Esthetician Advocacy on Facebook, you'll see a field of orange poppies all across the front. That's our group. Uh, we are also a trade association um, in California called California Aesthetic Alliance, which is aesthetic with an A. And um, uh, we, we do a lot of interacting. We're at all those meetings. We are at all those hearings. We are communicating literally with Christy live as it happens. And we are so fortunate that we have the coordination and the cooperation with the Board of Barbering and Cosmetology that they realize that we are the folks that want to do the right thing and we want to run our businesses the right way and, and be safe for the public, be safe for ourselves. So California Esthetician, Esthetician Advocacy with the Orange Poppies, and then also California Aesthetic Alliance with an A uh, is our trade association. And we really need more members of our trade association because every time I meet with the legislature and I have to defend the fact that we are, you know, 
getting hit with another deregulation bill, they go, well, how many people are you actually talking about that are my constituents? And I'm like, exactly this many. So I love numbers and stats. It's kind of fun to throw that accurate information, accurate stats, um, and uh, that's really important to me as well. So well, we were going to, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank thanks you, for Lynn. being here too, Wendy. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. We were going to repurpose this into a podcast episode, but I think Matilda has made sure that that's not possible. And um, I love her for it. So thank you, Matilda, in the background. I, I'm um, happy to come on anytime you want. She says, you're welcome. Um, I'm happy to come on anytime and record with you and we can go over some stuff and maybe throw up some appropriate links and um, some more official language rather than the banter that we are uh, very famous for having anyways. We're very fancy. All right. Um, any final thoughts before we run away? I just wanted to say there was that last question there that was asked by Lori about whether manicurists can associate with you. Uh, I know I'm the closest manicurist associate that you have, Wendy, yeah. but uh, certainly through the California Aesthetic Alliance, that's open to every type of license in the state of California. The estheticians and advocacy group that she talked about on Facebook Wendy will check to see that you are licensed as either an esthetician or a cosmetologist to join that particular group. Yeah, Good and I know. checked her, and despite, uh, yeah, so I had a senator go, you don't really check every single one of those licenses. And I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> so Yes, I do, yes, I do. There's a great, um, I wanna give a shout out to uh, a fabulous Thing for that it's called beauticians list if anybody ever needs to quickly take a look at, at licenses now we'll shout out to dasha and beauticians list all right well again uh your calls to action if you want to connect with us of course are at outgrowth podcast on instagram and you can listen to outgrowth podcast with a new episode every monday on your favorite podcast platform jamie you want to um shill for some reviews on apple Podcasts? Sure. <laughs> you can subscribe, rate, and review us. Uh, we will read your review if you leave us one through Apple Podcasts. We'll even read a negative review. Oh, yeah. Bring it. Bring it. I bring it. We're I can't wait for, for that to happen. I'm, I'm excited. Imagine. Anyone would have a negative review. <laughs> we want to hear it all. <laughs> That's uh, fine. Lay it on We me. haven't had That's... to yet, though. How about that? True. True. Let so, you know, you guys got to catch up with me. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, everybody, for watching, for tuning in. If you're watching on the replay, please connect with us on all of our social channels. Give us a listen. And uh, if you want us to do this again, just let us know in the comments what type of topic you want us to tackle. And uh, until next time, be smart. Be safe. Wear all a right. mask. Wear yes. all a mask. All right. Be compliant. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.